I've got a few questions to start with. Uh, I know you're all dying to ask some questions, but I thought I'd, I'd start with you, if I could, at Wiener. Um, just in terms of your operation, uh, what do you think is the potential for other people in intensive livestock industries, and what's stopping people, or what, what would they be looking for to take up those opportunities? Is it information? Is it sort of technology? What are the things that you think that would be useful in terms of promoting what you've done on your property uh, further around the country? Um, I think there's a lot of other pig farmers who are underway with a pro project similar to ours. Um, and there's certainly a few abattoirs that have things. I think that there'll be a, a pretty quick take up of these projects. It took us about two years from learning about this technology to getting the project running so it doesn't happen overnight. Um, and I think it also helps to have an economy of scale. So, um, but I'm sure there are ways that you could do smaller models and, and still be um, economically viable as well. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got a question for each of the panel members, so I'm going to be a bit selfish and then I'll, then I'll turn to the audience. Um, just, just in terms of, you mentioned, Shailene, about what was happening in further negotiations, and we are linked to the European system. What do you see as the opportunities there in terms of carbon farming for Australia? So, so, so thank you, Mark. Um, so, so look, I, I think um, the, the benefits of having our carbon price mechanism linked with uh, the largest emissions trading scheme in, in the world are, are going to be quite significant. Um, as people know, we currently have, have the one-way link um, that, that, that's sort of coming into effect and, and, and means that uh, from, from 2015, 16 onwards, people will be able to use uh, European units to meet their carbon price obligations. Um, with, with respect to what will happen with the Carbon Farming Initiative particularly, um, that's one of the issues that uh, is, is under uh, will, will be under negotiation between the Australian officials and, and, and people from, from the EU. Um, it, it's been a very interesting um, set of discussions on all of that. Um, I, I actually went, went to Europe last year and, and, and began sort of talking to some people about what we were trying to do with CFI. I think it's fair to say that, that a number of the officials I spoke to uh, we're very interested and, and perhaps a bit reassured about the very strong environmental integrity provisions of the CFI. Um, th things like we, we have the Domestic Offsets Integrity Committee reviewing all the methodologies to see if they stack up against the integrity criteria. Things like having the scheme administered by the Clean Energy Regulator, uh, the, the very strong monitoring, reporting uh, and, and verification provisions in the scheme and, and the fact that, of course, it, it's backed up by some pretty stringent compliance penalties. So, so look, I, I think it's going to be very interesting to see, see how those discussions go. Uh, it, it's probably uh, far, far too early to, to say where, where they might fetch up at, at this stage. Um, so some of you that have been in this in this space for a while will be aware that uh, this whole set of issues around abatement from the land sector has been something that's been quite controversial and, and hotly contested in the international negotiations. Um, so, so it's very good that we've got this current set of rules that, that were agreed actually at the Durban meeting uh, and, and, and really now in place for, for, for the uh, second commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol and, and, and for people to use. M my own hope is that, that we're moving into an, an era where, where people are mu much more comfortable w with the idea of, a, of abatement from, from the land sector and indeed approaches like the CFI. And Halal, your presentation was very much on the opportunities in livestock. What about cropping? Um, <clears throat> uh, like, we sort of uh, looked at the technical potential um, available to cropping, mainly current research is focusing on fertilizer use and all. Um, again, um, we're dealing with the whole economy and we're uh, trying to uh, sort of picture it in the context of potential machinery development and all. Uh, so we, ha we haven't undertaken any research yet, but this is part of our ongoing research program. 
So when science becomes much more certain and we see methodologies are coming up, we will look into that. And you know, as I mentioned in my presentation, we need to have a good understanding of the potential for the CFI credit as a whole. Uh, in isolation, for livestock, we wouldn't really give the full picture. So that's part, very much part of uh, the future project. So I have enough questions from the audience now. Oh, we do have some microphones. Uh, just remind people if they can identify themselves, the organisation they come from, and who they wish to direct their question to. I think we have one down the front here. First of all, um, Khan Joe from the Commonwealth Bank in Brisbane. And first of all, thank you for that presentation, Millis. I'm very informative. Um, a large chunk of our agricultural industry in especially central northern Queensland and northern territory is grazing cattle. I was just wanting to throw it open to the panel members. Um, do you see any potential? I know there, there is a lot in intensive livestock um, industries, but in, in terms of grazing where you have one head of cattle running around on five or ten hectares of land, um, is there any potential there that you see? Um, Again, um, we sort of looked at a few technologies. Uh, feed supplements is one, and also vaccines, another one, which will apply these sort of um, settings. Um, but um, in, in terms of the very extensive grazing and all, um, we are not, uh, uh, well, um, in our analysis, we haven't included that much. Uh, but definitely over time, there will be uh, more technologies and uh, there could be market innovation to s some way to uh, deal with that. That's probably an optimistic view from an economics. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> uh, so, so look, I, I think our, our view and, and, and aspiration is that um, to, to really look at something that, that's perhaps a bit more landscape based. So. You know, at the moment we have um, a methodology for reducing emissions from, from savanna fires. Um, w we're wanting to look at approaches that would allow, you, you know, restoration or, or preservation of, of um, native vegetation. Um, and then there's some, some suite of possible activities around feral animal management. So, so I think what we would see is, is the prospect for the north is an approach whereby you, you endeavour to bundle a, a series of these sorts of activities t together and, and have them as, as, as a suite of, of, of projects that are, are on perhaps the same area of land that, that could give you credits. Um, but because I think I, I would agree with Halal, some, some of the approaches around, around actual reducing emissions for, from, from herds when they're actually grazing are probably a little little way away. Um, that that said, though, uh, you know, once you have you have the opportunity of the benefit from something like CFI, and it being linked to the carbon price mechanism, then I think that starts to send quite a powerful investment signal to people. And and again, you know, you just don't know how the market's going to respond to some of these things. Yeah, my name's James Houston, I'm a, a cattle producer in the south. So it's basically the same question, you know, in southern Australia we don't see anything available in carbon farming for, for cattlemen and, and grazing. Um, we're one of the few farmers though who <coughs> got involved in the biodiversity fund and it's great to hear that you know, I'm excited about carbon farming. I think it, it's a long road, though, to see how it's going to translate into an uptake by day-to-day -day farmers. Um, you're talking a lot about what's available to farmers through the funding and stuff, but through that biodiversity and the um, filling the research gap and action on the ground, to my knowledge, only three farms have actually received money. Most of it goes to the um, natural resource management or organisations and stuff representing farmers, but to actually get the money onto the ground, onto farms, is going to be difficult, I think. Um, a lot of it's incentive-based, what you're doing, 
The project that we're putting in place, which is the management of native grasses in hill country, it's fantastic what we're doing. We feel in enhancing the biodiversity, but for us that's just going to translate to increased livestock production, which is that classic carbon leakage. We don't see how what you're promoting is going to transfer to us to carbon credits. So the next thing to try and keep being innovative, which is what Halal's talking about, hearing what you're doing with Savannah, we're going to trial fire in the south to see whether we convert dry matter into better feed conversion to reduce our livestock emissions. So I'll be interested to see whether you're going to let us through on action on the ground. <laughs> Um, yeah, look, look, I think it, it's, it's very interesting and, and, and as I think we're acknowledging some of it, it, it is a bit challenging. Um, I, 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 I guess um, one of the things I would say is that, that it might be possible that, that some of the, the approaches that are around um, dairy, feed additives, feedlot finishing, the methane capture, um, you know, the economists will tell you that, that you should start to see some downstream benefits of those sorts of approaches that, that, that would flow on onto the producers themselves. Um, I, I'm sure that that's probably quite a co contestable point and, and ha happy to, to have some discussions over, over morning tea on that. But, but I think if you're looking uh, across an industry or a sector as a whole, um, th th there might be some benefits at, at that kind of level. The, the other thing I would mention in, in the absence of, of perhaps someone fr from DAF to, to respond is that I think it's always been the case that the opportunities from carbon farming w w will be quite specific to the individual landholder. And that's why one of the measures in carbon farming futures was the extension and outreach measure. And, and I think the idea there is that, that once that program gets up and running, uh, you, you, you will see uh, people that, that, that are tasked with and funded to go out on farm and talk to individual farmers about the opportunities that, that might be available to them. So, so again, take your points completely about, about dairy. Very interested to hear that you're looking to trial savannah burning in, 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 um, in, in, in those sorts of areas. That, that will be extremely innovative. Uh, and, and then just whether there's some opportunities around the, the sorts of things like uh, vegetation establishment or, or, or fencing off, um, d just things that, that perhaps don't relate to, to the, to, to the um, herd management per se, but, but can be done on, on an individual piece of land that can give you some diversified revenue streams. Yeah, that's all true. The, the uptake in a lot of it's going to be huge, the costs to try and generate credits and how that how farmers are going to determine their business decisions will be on that, and it's, it's all unknown ground. One of the issues that we're encountering, though, is adjustment. What's going to happen in that field? If we've got um, a herd of cattle that are producing greenhouse emissions on our land, if they go on to adjustment onto somebody else's land, who, who's responsible for their methane? So, so the way the, the methodologies work is that, is that, that all, all the emissions that are the direct result of the project uh, need to be actually captured by the project boundaries. So, so, so they're part of what you look at in terms of working out you, you know, what, you, what your net credits will be. Do you understand my question though? It's like it, if you're on a farm system and you're working out your livestock emissions, who, who gets the emissions if it's on somebody else's land, though, w when you move cattle around? So, 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 so that turns around who the actual proponent of the project is? Yeah, OK, I got you. I, I think in part you're also talking about if there's actually a market arrangement. And I suspect if there's any sort of commodity of value, then it would be very sensible to, in your arrangements with the whoever you're adjusting the property to, that you've got some contractual agreement that talks about who's going to get the benefit. Exactly. Yeah. But I think what you're saying is there's complexity and we're at the beginning of this and there's a long way to work through to actually get the benefits. Mm -hmm. And people will obviously need to make their own judgments about, well, is, is it worth, in terms of economic return, the cost investment to actually participate in those schemes? And that will obviously change with the sensitivity of pricing around carbon and essentially how international negotiations go. So a lot of unknowns at this stage, but we're, we're beginning the process, I think, at least so. Uh, another question? 
There's one in the center, one on the edge there. Do we have a microphone at all? Oh. Steve Morrow, uh, Horticulture Australia. I've got a question for uh, Edwina. Um, you didn't talk about the capital cost of the project and the sort of payback that you expected. The, um, the capital cost of the project was close to a million dollars for us um, and the payback period is a bit over two years. Thank you. I think there's one in the centre here as well. Sir. Hi, Nathan Westling from AJMPA McBride, we're wool producers. I've got a question for the whole panel. Um, can you um, explain what you think the opportunities and risks are to the CFI for a potential change in government? <laughs> so, so, sorry if you were sort of ducking on that one, I think. Um, I'll leave this one for the panel, good. Yeah. <laughs> Look, a very good question. Um, we, we actually do have bipartisan support for the CFI. Um, so so when, when the legislation w was going through the parliament, um, I, I think that the, the tone of the debate was there, there might be some things that, that uh, a, a new coalition government would want to have a look at and, and, and think about and perhaps change. But, but the overall measure uh, that they support, um, so, so yeah. I'll make sure my carbon credits are approved and sold just to be safe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I think in part too, we're, we're yet to see any policy statements of detail in terms of whether there would be any different positions. Uh, and, you know, we can only wait to see what the positions are that the, the parties take in terms of the future. Um, and uh, obviously, uh, whatever, whoever forms government and whatever their policy is, those things will need to be put in place. Further questions? Um, obviously the uh, land sector is a biological sector compared to some of the other sectors which are obviously human driven so to speak um, and the 20% numbers thrown about 16 20% what <coughs> if we're going to have the same production of agriculture as we do now with no productivity growth which is obviously as soon as we have productivity growth you increase your emissions we had the same what is the lowest percentage do you what's the what's the amount of reduction do you think we could get as a what should we be aiming at what's our target to have as a the amount of emissions while still having a productive agricultural sector oh sorry i'm chris sanders from dpi horsham too mm -hmm. <laughs> again um a desperate economics looking for uh the how uh, participants will respond Basically, the purpose of uh, our exercise is to have a bit of a sense, um, um, looking at the carbon prices and the potential uptake. But end of the day, um, it's the stakeholders, the farmers, um, and <coughs> land managers who will decide um, how to respond to uh, the market signals. You know what I mean. So, uh, oh, and and the good thing about this is it's market based. It's not command and control, you don't set a target. An offset market is feeding into the compliance market <laughs> and um, uh, the voluntary market. And so that will determine how much is possible and whether you can continue growing or growing at that current level and still contributing to uh, emission outcomes. We haven't done that analysis, but I, I know what you're coming from. That will depend on the, the commodities you're producing, how prices are moving, you know, input cost, output prices, and all, and all vis-a-vis the co-product co or you know the the uh, carbon reduction that you are undertaking, their market value, and all that. So basically, at the end of the day, it's, it's 
your decision who is you know, taking the project. So it's difficult for us to do all that. We can run, in, I mean, internationally there are some um, um, in initiatives or exercise going on, bringing in all those uh, factors and drivers uh, for decision making. But at the end of the day, this is an academic exercise and they run a few scenarios and if anyone is equally likely. So probably uh, from a researcher point of view, I think we will st sort of we'll take that. But from a practical point of view, um, action on the ground, that's probably the, yeah, uh, so, way to go. So, so look, um, very interesting question. Uh, I, I guess a couple of observations. Um, the, the first is that, that, as Halal's saying, carbon farming is a voluntary scheme. No, no one has to participate uh, if, if they don't, don't want to. Um, so, and, and of course the government has said that it has no intention of, of drawing the agricultural sector I into the, the carbon price itself. So, so I, I think there, there's sort of some comfort ar around the policy setting because carbon farming is optional and, and, and very much on the benefit side that you know people will, uh, will participate if, if they think that they'll derive a, an economic or other benefit from it. So, so I, I guess I see it as, as, as fairly win-win in, in terms of, of, of how that, that will, will work and, as Halal says, fit together with the carbon price. I just want to know how we, how we know what that means. So, so, well, so, you know, you, you can look at the sorts of things that, that, that people usually look at when they're assessing a measure. So, so how, how many tonnes of abatement, what, what was your sort of uptake of projects, th th things like that. Uh, and in fact, the Climate Change Authority, the, the body the government set up um, to, 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 to keep an eye on all, all the policy settings around, around the clean energy package, is doing a review of carbon farming <coughs> in 2014. So, so I think that will be a very good exercise to start to test some of, some of the questions that, that you're asking. Charlene, can I perhaps just ask a, a follow on to that? Would, would, would the National Carbon Accounting Framework sort of pick up changes in the sector over time? A a absolutely. So, so of course, um, and, and I think in my presentation, uh, as did Halal, we, we had some estimates of what we thought the abatement that, that might be realised by the, by the measure would be. But, but of course, um, the, the, these emissions reductions are captured in our reporting to the UN every year. Uh, it's actually something that my division prepares and, and, and does look very much at, at what the impact of, of, of these sorts of measures are in terms of reducing our emissions. Question over here. I can just go up to that. Yeah, well, you can, Michael, I know that. <laughs> So it's a very good question. Um, we always had in mind when we were designing the CFI that, that we wanted to uh, incentivise, I guess, co-benefits. Co and that was one of the reasons why we went down the route we did for the common practice test, because um, with respect to your point about, you know, learning new ways to farm and, and doing it more efficiently, 
One of the problems with your traditional financial additionality test is that it actually creates a disincentive to do things that are actually going to give you a benefit in terms of your bottom line. Um, so, so, so absolutely we were very keen to, to allow for uh, approaches that would improve environmental and economic sustainability on, on farm. And, and I think the whole idea of reducing fertiliser use is a very good example of that because that potentially can deliver both economic co-benefits as, as well as environmental. So, so obviously if you can reduce the amount of fertiliser you apply, uh, th then you're delivering an efficiency benefit to your bottom line and also potentially delivering benefit to the environment in terms of things like reducing agricultural runoff. So, 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 so yes, very, very good question. If you're asking have we, have we actually sat down and tried to quantify what, what those benefits are, I, I, I think the answer, well, the short answer is no, no we haven't, haven't done, done that yet. And as far as I know, ABARES hasn't either, but a very good suggestion for, for some future work. Um, part of the challenge, of course, is, is, is trying to quantify uh, in economic terms exactly what your environmental benefits might be, um, al although there is some really good work using environmental indicators that, that could be applied to that. But look, I think it's a really interesting idea and something we should give a bit of thought to. No, the major, major part of that is not buying electricity. So we've eliminated our um, electricity and gas bill that could have been $150,000 or $200,000 a year. So that's the main, main part, really. That was our whole reason for entering into it. We're very pleased that we fit within the Carbon Farming Initiative. So but part of the grant is the capital requirement yep. And I think that's actually a very important point, too, about the incentive structures and looking at the business in terms of what are all the components that contribute to an economically sensible or business decision? I think we've got time for one more question. <coughs> Just up in the centre there. Uh, So, so, so Chris, um, I, I think if I'm understanding, you, you're, you're sort of alluding to, to some sort of investment risk in terms of people looking to, to invest in, in projects at, at now. Is that... Is that Yeah, look, um, I, 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 can un, I, can understand, I, can, I can understand the concern. Um, I, I, I guess that the, thing, the thing that I would say is that, again, it, it's this, this distinction between short, shorter term fluctuations in, in markets and prices uh, and, 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 and the longer term in, in investment signal. Um, so, so, so clearly, you, you know, for governments that put in place market mechanisms, there, there's a, a number of policy levers that, that, that can be applied to, to, to look at that, that sort, of, sort of problem. Um, and, and, and look at this stage, I, I think, you know, the, the, we, we've got the fixed price for, for the three years. Um, pe people have that degree of certainty ar around the return that they'll be getting on their investment. Um, and, 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 you know, as I say, pe people will be looking at, at those sorts of issues down the track. 
Um, the other point, of course, is that, that EU linking is quite important in terms of tying our scheme to, to as I say, the, the, the biggest emissions trading market in, in the world. And, and of course, as some people might be aware, uh, the EU has, has been looking at, 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 at possible measures to, 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 I guess, address what the, the perceptions of, of, of their, their lower prices at, at the moment, although it's still a little unclear what, what decisions will be taken in that regard. Perhaps I can just make a quick comment too, just in terms of sort of the, the land clearing component. You know, from my knowledge, virtually every state has some other policy framework which regulates land clearing activity, so it wouldn't just be related to price. There'd be other mechanisms that would be at play in terms of what's available. And if it's obviously plantations, plantations are a long-term agricultural crop in many other ways as well, so replacing that with some other agricultural crop uh, provided that, you know, it does take the opportunities, may not necessarily have the, have the disbenefits as well. But I mean, I think we're, we're all recognising the, the, the degree of complexity and more policy work and actual experience that we need to do in this space to obviously have the full potential available to the, to the productive, productive sector. Hello, you want to make a comment? Just, just to articulate the first point that Kevin made, um, look at the share markets. Every day it's flipping and people are making decisions on the basis of that. But some of the more, you know, uh, serious ones probably look at the trends and would look for fundamentals and long-term credible policy signals. So just a uh, analogy, if you like. But current market is not all that developed like the share market. So probably not a good comparison, but that's something to ponder about. Thank you for that. Uh, I am going to bring the session to a close now. Uh, each year, this is an interim session, and we continue to get further information and further experience from the session in, in the ABES Outlook Conference. Um, I look forward to seeing what will be on our agenda next year <laughs> in terms of uh, policy development, methodology, methodology agreement, uh, further experience in, in the actual uh, production sector of people who are taking the opportunities. And I think we're going to see some exciting things over a number of years in this space. Uh, and I think it's going to be great to be part of it. Can I firstly thank, thank you all for participating as an audience in this session? And can I also ask you to, to thank me once, to thank once again the presenters that we heard this morning, Dr. Halal ha Ahmed, uh, Shonan Thompson, and Edwina Beveridge. Uh, thank you very much for your presentations. And <laughs>